Uh, AJ, you want to start while Vince gets your presentation? Sure. Uh, my last name Shaka it was slightly Shaka. misprinted. Sorry. But, uh, <laughs> no, no, no offense taken. I'm a chemist by training. I'm a tenured professor at UC Irvine. Uh, my specialty is physical chemistry. And uh, I am still interested in doing new research, even though I have tenure. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> and uh, my, specialty, my specialty is solution structure determination. And uh, I have a background in nuclear magnetic resonance, which is a completely different kind of nuclear uh, endeavor. But uh, by a trick of fate, I became more and more involved with the nuclear reactor. And at UCI, we have a long tradition of ex expertise in atmospheric chemistry. We have a Department of Earth System Sciences, which studies global change. And we have interdepartmental seminars in which uh, the news was never good. In fact, the news was always worse than it was last time based on the uh, last projection of the trend lines. So I became more and more interested in uh, solutions to this problem. And we're the only chemistry department, I believe, currently, that has an operating nuclear reactor. The others are in physics departments. And it's a 250 kilowatt conventional reactor with some very tricky fuel so that it has strictly negative reactivity. It's 100% safe. And it was commissioned to study tracer chemistry in the atmosphere and to do neutron activation analysis. The bullets that killed President Kennedy were analyzed in the trigger reactor by neutron activation analysis, for example. Um, when I took up my position, I was interested mostly in determining the structures of drugs, natural products, and biomolecules. Um, but we had a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Sherry Rowland, who won the Nobel Prize for the ozone hole work. He discovered a problem, and then the problem got fixed very, very quickly before it became an extremely bad problem. I think we're almost at that position right now with respect to CO2. We also had another uh, professor who started the Department of Earth System Science, whose name was Ralph Cicerone, he's now president of the National Academy. He was always interested in the greenhouse effect, which none of the rest of us paid much attention to at the time because the ozone hole seemed like the big thing. But the greenhouse effect is nothing other than adding more and more CO2 and other greenhouse gases and heating up the planet. Um, in 2007, I became vice chair for facilities, and that's all the facilities in the department, so I had to worry about the reactor. And I mean worry, as in I don't understand what the reactor is, what the risks are, who's in charge, what if we have an earthquake, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I learned an awful lot. And what I learned caused me to become interested in the reactor itself and uh, interested in experiments I could do with the reactor. About five years prior to that, I'd become interested in the chemistry of aging and, I can, and especially longevity and how to live to a ripe old age. I can tell you that that is pretty much a dead end. <laughs> but you learn a lot of interesting things when you do research in what can kill you. And now that you're all seated, I thought I would bring this one out. It turns out that the more you sit, the quicker you go. And that's independent of whether you get on the treadmill for 15 minutes or not. You have to keep moving in order to stay alive. So the department seminars made CO2 a focus. Uh, and it seemed like so solar power was the answer, but then I didn't understand the economics of any of this. And then when I realized how expensive it would be, I had a quote for $16,000 to put uh, ground-based solar in my backyard. And at $32 a month, being a tier one user, 
that's a 500 month payback and my research on length longevity convinced me that I was not going to live 500 months. That was not the present value of money or anything else. And so uh, I became interested in solar thermal, which seemed like it might be cheaper because it seems like a no-brainer. But the problem with solar thermal is storing the power. That's really the problem that all the intermittent ones have. With solar thermal, they're trying to use molten salts, but not molten salts like we're, we've heard about at this conference that are very, very high temperature, uh, uh, you know, alkali, uh, fluoride salts and that type, but rather ionic liquids, materials that have huge <coughs> liquid ranges. And the problem is that over time, the uh, molten salts they use tend to chemically degrade under the heat and they become other things and then they clog the pipes and apparently the problem is still not solved. I thought it was solved, it's not solved yet and uh, they had some designs for plants and uh, I don't know how they're going to execute them. So my conclusion is that solar is intermittent and only for the rich at this time and that's not most of the world. Wind turbines also look promising but if a wind turbine is spinning and you have an earthquake, then there's an awful lot of force generated on the wind turbine. And depending what happens, you may lose your whole field of wind turbines. And there are earthquakes in California fairly frequently. The other thing is that they, if they're spinning at night, they kill bats. And they kill lots of bats depending where they're deployed. Bats apparently, even with their uh, uh, sonar, are, are not able to figure out what these things are and fly straight into them. I was unaware of that. The power is intermittent, storage is still a problem, and in a lot of areas the wind doesn't blow much at night. So it's off when, when solar's off, and that, that's probably not so good. Here's one approach to solar uh, in Spain. This is seven megawatts of electricity that there's a house in the foreground for scale. I like to hike and run and I, I wouldn't like to see every mountain range everywhere covered with these solar panels, nor would I want to see who maintains them and keeps them clean after a flock of seagulls flies <laughs> over and the goes down. <laughs> This is the kind of alarming thing that leads me to believe that we better take fairly quick action. This is a projection of the world four degrees. The problem is that there's a lot of desert and the desert is where we all live. <clears throat> and it says uninhabitable due to floods, drought or extreme weather, uninhabitable desert, land loss to sea levels. This, on the surface of it, looks like a complete disaster by 2100. And this will cost a lot more money than any amount of money that people have been talking about here to mitigate this kind of thing. Um, it says at the bottom there, you can't read it, but it says South America, un unrecognizable, high-rise cities are here. But nobody owns Antarctica, so you can only imagine what's going to happen. If you wonder how desertification happens, here's how it happens. You're living there, you're farming, you're out of there. There's nothing you can do. You can take caterpillars and try to push the sand back all day long. That's not gonna work. Now, if that's your whole investment, that land and that farming and so forth, you've been wiped out. You have nothing left whatsoever the Nobel Prize winner Paul Crutzen said that he'd like to be optimistic that we'll survive, but he's got no good reason to be. In order to be safe, we'd have to reduce our carbon emissions by 70% by 2015. We are currently putting in 3% more every year. This is global budget, not, not U.S. However, I, I was still deeply suspicious about nuclear power because I knew nothing about it. And I think that's really the, the core problem is that nuclear has been off the scope, off the radar now for years and years and years. 
and uh, people don't know much about it, and technology has moved on, and uh, it's actually much better than uh, anybody suspected. I learned about the technology, and then I learned that our only reactor was 70 plus years old, and I thought he was a lot younger than that. And that got me thinking as to why he looked so good. <laughs> <laughs> but I worried that something might happen to him. And that then something might happen to the reactor, and he was the only one who knew how to operate it. So I decided to get trained. And the more I worried, the more I worried about the health effects of radiation, and the, the more I read on it, and the more I read on it, the less I worried about it. Because it turns out, unless you get blasted with radiation, or get hit with neutrons or something, or eat an alpha emitter, there's probably very little danger. And I think that's an important message for people to understand. Those Paracelsus said, the do dose makes the poison. Here's an example of an article that was about living to 100 that I read when I was interested in longevity. And the idea is that uh, actually radiation and other stress mechanisms, if they're mild, are rather like exercise. They do a little bit of damage, your muscle gets sore the day after, there's a little damage, and then what happens? It gets stronger, and it emerges on the other side better, as long as you don't overdo it and pull it out. All right? So there's a limit to this kind of hormetic effect but it is a real effect. And when Johns Hopkins uh, uh, looked at uh, uh, longshoremen, they looked at 28,000 nuclear shipyard workers to study the effects of doses of radiation, mostly to see how poorly they had fared. And to their surprise, they found that the mortality rate among these workers was 24% lower than in a control group of 32,500 shipyard workers who hadn't offloaded any uranium. Yes? I've heard about that same study. If I was working at a shipyard and I had a guy who was going to work on something nuclear related, I'm probably going to pick the guy that sort of got, got a quit spot. Oh, I, I think in all these epidemiological studies, you have to be extremely careful uh, what you control for. People who drink wine are usually wealthier uh, uh, and better educated. Uh, than people who drink moonshine. <laughs> and so you have to be careful about your <laughs> My apologies. I'm proud of you. Um, this book made a deep impression on me. If you haven't read it, it's, it's very important to read it. It's about the aftermath of Chernobyl, the worst nuclear accident involving a reactor ever. And you might think it would be a complete disaster there because of the high levels of radiation. But it, in fact, is quite the opposite. The complete disaster is to have people. Once the people are gone, it turns into an enchanted forest again with all kinds of animals and plants and things going through the concrete. And it's a very, very interesting book to read. I think it surprised the author as well. So in 2009, we hired a Swedish-trained expert on nuclear fuel cycles, and we became friends. And I really decided to become a licensed reactor operator. I'm not a current operator yet. You have to go through quite a rigmarole to get actually get the license to operate the reactor, background check, this and that and the other. Um, and Professor Nielsen cannot operate the reactor at all because he's not a U.S. citizen. That's just not allowed, even though he's an expert in nuclear fuels and is a very mild-mannered guy. <laughs> <laughs> we also have some experiments underway using some pretty energetic gamma rays at low total dose um, to define the J-shaped curve for radiation harm. In, uh, in other words, J-shaped means that when there's no radiation, let's say it's zero, and when there's a small amount of radiation, you actually do better. You have less damage. And then as you increase beyond what your body can cope with, you have too much and you get overwhelmed and then you have bad effects. Um, but the idea that 
emission of, of spent nuclear fuel or the radioactive exposure has to be identically zero is one thing that holds up a lot of, uh, uh, of things in this country and it, it's important to understand whether that is in fact true scientifically before you start making regulations. Here are the uh, re reactor features. It's just a 250 kilowatt res research reactor. It's 20% U-235 with zirconium hydride. It uh, actually has a feature to make it go like Chernobyl, and it's designed actually to do that. And it's one of the unique features of the reactor. The control rods are fixed with compressed air, and they have fuel followers. And at a moment's notice, you can take 60 PSI and blow them out suddenly and and the power output goes up to over a gigawatt or 900 megawatt that region for about 10 milliseconds and then promptly on its own just drop straight back down and it's quiescent because of the xenon 135 poisoning and because of the beauty of Teller's zirconium hydride fuel uh, that was a, just a brilliant idea. The more I read about the early people in this field, the more I can appreciate what intellectual giants they were. Um, it, this reactor is completely harmless. There's nothing you could ever do to it. Um, yet, it's still very unpopular with some people around Orange County who probably don't know much about how it works and are scared of it. So here's my summary. The chemists who specialize in the bottom of the periodic table are in short supply. No, we don't train people typically to work with those elements because there's no money in it. Uh, the, element, the money is in organic chemistry making pharmaceuticals, not in playing around with phase diagrams of molten salts. Chemists, I can tell you, as far as I can ascertain, use thorium for absolutely nothing. And therefore, you're free to burn up all the thorium you want and get rid of it. Doesn't matter to me or any of my colleagues at all. Uh, but petroleum, we do use. Petroleum is a major, major deal for all kinds of things. Now, how are we going to make uh, what we need to make, that, that will also be a disaster if any of us are still around. And then I'd just like to say that I think the linear uh, no threshold claims have probably not been verified at low dose. There seems to be some disagreement. And finally, I, I'll close by just saying extrapolation is an error-prone endeavor. And when you're trying to ex extrapolate, you should probably be cautious and not be overly optimistic about the future. Thank you.